see the news, you heard about a young lady who escaped from 88 days of imprisonment. You heard about a young woman who dedicated her life to be a police officer and was ambushed, executed, and executed. And if you read the news, you know that 800,000 Americans received a paycheck today or yesterday that said zero income. It's the insanity of our government. Aren't you getting tired of this world? There's so many heartbreaking stories out there. I want to share with you one of my, my favorite quotes. Here in the Lord, it's revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. So this should be the first one. So we want to get rid of all these terrible news stories. We need to be pursuers of true godliness. Amen. So I want to say that there must be earnest effort to obtain the blessings of the Lord, not because God is not willing to bestow His blessings upon us, but because we are unprepared to receive it. But it is our work, by confession, humiliation, repentance, and earnest prayer, to fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to grant us His blessings. A revival need be expected only in answer to prayer. Earnest prayer, earnest prayer is essential to our spiritual growth. And yet it is the, probably the one tool that God gives us that's most unused, most neglected, that is a prayer. The highest stage of prayer that we can aspire to is the most spiritually enriching. In earnest prayer, that sincere prayer offering not only comforts you in times of grief, not only gives you hope in a world surrounded with distress, but it, it enables you to experience peace even when all others around you are in a state of chaos. Jesus said in Mark 11, verse 24, Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have it, and it will be yours. And when Jesus said believe there, in the Greek it means to continue to believe and never stop believing. Faith is the key to a victorious prayer life. Prayer of submission, total and unconditional submission to the will of God. It is only as we reach this place in our spiritual life, in our spiritual journey, do we experience genuine peace of mind. Think through the scriptures. All the great men who had great faith in the Lord, like Paul and Silas, who were beaten and abused and were sitting in prison, and, and they could be heard at midnight singing and giving thanks to God and praising Him instead of sitting there and feeling sorry for themselves. Instead of wondering, Am I going to get out of here alive? They were praising God. They were focused on God. They, they lived to glorify God. Amen. They were so wrapped up in their love for Him, they lost sight of their personal needs. Then there's Stephen, the first martyr in the, in the New Testament. Even while he was being stoned, he was praying for those men who were murdering him. Concerned for their salvation. And you might wonder, how could he do that? How could he be concerned about the people who are murdering him? Well, if you read Acts chapter 7, you discover that it was because he was totally focused on Jesus Christ. He had given his life to the service of the Lord. 
And he saw beyond his present circumstances and found absolute peace with God. And this is what the prayer of submission is about. And then look at Jesus. The Bible tells us that even though he was the Son of God, he felt a need to spend time in prayer. And if Jesus needs time in prayer, don't you think we need time in prayer? Amen. Don't you think we need to invest in this, this amazing arsenal that God has given us? Have you ever called the doctor's office and the person who answers and says, can you hold? <laughs> when you get an answering machine, oh my God, there's no input on hold. He's always there to hear our prayers. And he's always there to answer our prayers, even though we don't always understand the answer. It's been recorded that Jesus spent hours and hours in the evenings secluded in prayer. And the reason he did this is because prayer brings power. And if the Son of Man needed power, we need power. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus felt the weight of sin on his shoulders. And he began praying. And this prayer of submission that is included in the three synoptic Gospels is the prayer that every Christian must learn to pray. <coughs> Looking forward to the cross, Jesus recognized the suffering he would incur, but more importantly, he was concerned about being separated from the Father. And Jesus fell on the ground, and he prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Jesus could have easily abandoned his mission. He could have said, it's just too much. And it really was. Amen. And the human side of him said, if it be possible, take this cup from me. That was the human side of Jesus. It wasn't so much the agony as it was the separation. But through countless hours of prayer, the prayer of submission, Jesus said, but not my will be done. Amen. That saved the whole human, whole human race, didn't it? Amen. It gave every man and woman the opportunity to experience his eternal salvation. And immediately after Jesus finished that prayer, he was taken captive with men who were going to do the unthinkable to him. But if you read his conduct, Jesus was not drugged to the cross screaming and crying. He didn't fight back. He didn't even speak back. But as a lamb being led to the slaughter and as a sheep before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. He was totally submissive to the will of the Father. It's true, he, he expressed his desire not to have to go through this, but there really was no other way. And he said, not my will, but thine will be done. Can we as human beings be that submissive? Think about it. We've never seen God. Could we leave the hospital after being diagnosed <coughs> with terminal cancer? Or could we kneel beside the bed of a dying child and pray, not my will, but thine be done? The simple answer is no. We're not humanly capable of doing that. Not without the presence of the Holy Spirit. Not without our lives being fully submitted to Him. Because faith is the key to prayer. But you know that prayer is itself the key to faith. Prayer is so important not because our prayers bend God's will to us, because it, bend, it bends our wills to Him. In other words, prayer is 
strengthens our faith and allows us to trust God and, and to know that He's always got our interest in mind. Prayer allows us to be faithful, to be just, to be compassionate, even to those people with those signs that say, I'd rather have beer, just give me the money. Prayer gives us the ability to be kind and compassionate to people that offend you, Amen. to people you don't like or don't want to like. But without prayer, it is impossible to reflect the glory of Jesus. Amen. And selected messages. It says, there is nothing that Satan fears so much as that the people of God shall, have, shall clear the way by removing every hindrance so that the Lord can pour out His Spirit out of a languishing church and an infinite congregation. I don't know where I heard this, but Satan is weaker than the weakest Christian on his knees in prayer. Amen. He is powerless against us. Nothing can hinder the work of God or shut out His presence from His people if they will, with subdued, contrite hearts, confess and put away their sins in faith and claim His promises. Okay. 5,000 promises that God gives us to claim. And He is more willing to be faithful to those promises than we are willing to ask. In John 14, 27, Jesus tells us, Peace I leave with you, and my peace I give to you. This morning we sang that song, Fill My Cup, Lord. It's one of my favorite hymns. Don't you notice in, this, in the chorus it says that in order to be filled, we need to lift up our cup. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come with Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I won't no more. Fill my cup. Fill it up and make me whole. That's what Jesus wants. And that's what this communion service is about this morning. In a few minutes, we're going to part ways. I know them. the couples families are going to go into the fellowship room and through these two doors. God, where are the men going? In the elitist classroom here. Okay, the first classroom. First classroom. And where are the ladies going? To the back classroom. Okay. Now some of you may not be comfortable foot washing and you're more than welcome to remain seated. Don will be playing some music. You can reflect and meditate on the Lord. This time we're going to separate into those three different areas. A room for the couples or families, a room for women, and a room for men. Thank you.